Well, uh, thank you so much for coming here today. It's uh, uh, probably, uh, you know that you're a very impressive crowd. And uh, I know so many of you that, for me, it's the first time that I give a talk. It feels like giving a talk to friends and family. And uh, um, that can be intimidating sometimes, and sometimes it can be like also humbling. So um, I'm sure that you uh, have asked yourself many times, how these guys make a decision? How do they make a decision of how to treat patients? And uh, believe it or not, even today, a, a big part of these decisions are coming from statistics. And uh, um, this is the type of statistics I'm talking about. And that's what we call survival curves. And I want you to take a very close look to that uh, uh, slide and now totally ignore it. Because uh, uh, statistics can tell you how a group of patients can fare but how every single individual patient can do within this group is totally unknown, totally unknown. So the next step is to find out what we call precision medicine. And precision medicine is essentially trying to match a specific patient with a specific outcome. And if you ask a clinician of what precision medicine means today, it is taking a piece of the tumor, sending a tumor to a lab, and two or three weeks later, they give you a result that matches mutations with genes and drugs. And that's a great concept because you match a patient with a specific type of outcome. But in, rea in reality, this type of uh, precision medicine changes, changes the plan 11% of the time and changes the outcome only 3% of the time. And what better describes what's happening with precision medicine today is that uh, this paper from Memorial Sloan Kettering, out of almost 6,000 uh, primary tumors, only 7.5% were predictive of a change or of a, a different uh, type of treatment. So we ask ourselves, can we do something different? Uh, can, we, um, can we take a piece of the tumor and reconstruct the tumor in the lab? Every single person comes with, a, with its own tumor. Every single person is different. So can we take this tumor and grow that tumor in the lab in what we call a tumor organoid? Because at the end of the day, it's really cool to know what type of genes you have. But probably it's better to know what type of drug it works for your, tum your, your specific tumor, right? And this is how it works in real life. So this is a patient who comes in the, in the clinic. You know, there's too much disease. You see the liver in the middle is flowing within the tumor. We take a piece of the tumor and we create something like that. This is a tumor organoid. And uh, um, the only thing you see here is like you see a lot of green, and a lot of green means a lot of live cells. This is the, the cells of the patient who are, have been reconstructed as a live tumor in, in the lab. And a week later, what we do is we do that. So we check on the left side, you see different drugs at different concentrations. And on the right side, you see how many of the drugs of the cells from the patient stay alive. So it's not really a rocket science to realize that if red is dead cells, and green is alive cells, it's not really difficult to understand that you know, the patient responds better to this drug here. It's this platinum hypometrixate that kills um, the majority of the tumor, leaves only 11.8% of the tumor alive. So that gives you the option of trying also drugs who are not um, really uh, in the pipeline yet. So if you have like... Excuse me, some people are saying they can't hear. Can I move this? I think we can hear you better if we put it right there. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, um, so in, the same, in the same fashion, um, if you have drugs who they're not commercially available, you probably, uh, instead of uh, doing this prospective randomized trials, probably you can uh, check what drug is more promising in fighting a specific type of cancer. So Quite often, the patient comes back with a recurrence. Every time a patient comes back with a recurrence, the question is, well, is it the same tumor? Has it changed? Um, should I give the same drug or not? So the only thing you have to do is you have to, and that's a recurrence, you have to go and biopsy the tumor again, grow it, and find, find out what's working for this recurrence and what, what you have to give. And this is what happened in this case. This tumor was almost the same as before. So how is it done? The way we do that is we, uh, work with WFERM. WFERM is the Wake Forest Institute of Regenerative Medicine. It's one of the best biomedical engineering departments in the country. Uh, we take the piece of the tumor, we chop the tumors in very, very small pieces, and uh, then we wash it out. We wash it out with antibiotics, and 
we create a soup out of the tumor. We create a soup of cells. So whatever the, the tumor is uh, made of, we create a soup of all the different cells. And then we grow these cells in a hydrogel, a hydrogel that is very, very friendly to this type of tumor. And then we grow these tumors in these little wells here. And you have inflow and outflow cannulas, and we keep them alive. There's a computer-based pump that perfuses the tumor, and you keep alive for as long as you like. And uh, uh, because what I say again and again is that, you know, if you don't grow your uh, enemy, you cannot fight back. And because our enemy, uh, in the specific case, was appendiceal cancer, this is the first ever grown appendiceal cancer in the, in the lab. This is an appendiceal cancer from a patient. And you see uh, the green cells and the, the, the dead cells, the red cells. And when uh, uh, they called me that, you know, we have grown the first appendiceal cancer, we said, probably uh, that's too much, right? Let's check if this is indeed an appendiceal cancer or not. And we check it with a different uh, histological verification, and it was indeed an appendiceal cancer. And then we start testing this cancer with different drugs. And uh, uh, here, and we start growing more and more. Here you see like three high-grade appendiceal cancers, and there you see six low-grade appendiceal cancers. And what we noticed was that for a low-grade appendiceal cancer, regardless of what you treat it with, there is no response. And we knew that. I mean, low-grade appendiceal cancer does not respond to chemotherapy. On the other side, for high-grade appendiceal cancer, you see when the red is dead, five of you was killing the patient, oxaliplatin not so much, four folks it was, and regorafenib it was. But all of these drugs are different, different type of treatments, right? So that means that you have drugs who are like first-line chemotherapy, you have drugs who are second-line chemotherapy, and you have drugs who are third-line chemotherapy. So who really determines what line of chemotherapy you're going to give the patient? Not based on a cohort analysis, but based on the individual patient who's coming in front of you, right? So because for that, for that patient over there, regorafenib, that is a third-line medication, was doing better than a first-line medication. So when we start studying them, you see that these are the viability uh, assay for all the tumors. And you see that the red ones are the low-grade appendiceal cancers. And essentially, none of them were dying with chemotherapy. And the blue ones were the high-grade appendiceal cancers. And there was a variability in the response. Some of them were growing on, chemo on chemotherapy. So where we are today, we have we have grown a, a, a big variety of tumors, big variety of tumors. Uh, we have a 90% take rate. That means that you know, within five days, 90% of the patients have, have, have its own tumor grown in the lab. We can uh, um, produce results in five to 10 days, and we really have grown some rare primaries. And the cell cancer it is, a rare, it is a rare primary. Now, we cannot use them for clinical decision making right now, but this is, this is our direction. This is where we are heading to. And of course, the big question is, okay, all right, you grow this thing in the lab. How does it fare in terms of how the patient is doing? How is the organoid fares in terms of how the patient is doing when you give the chemotherapy? And this is the only slide that is not ours. This is, this is, this is, coming, from, this is coming from a group in uh, Manchester, UK. And they were studying uh, G junction cancers and uh, colorectal cancers. And they had an 88% positive predictive value. That means that when the organoid was responding to chemotherapy, the patient was responding 88% of the time, right? And they had a 100% negative predictive value. That means that when the organoid was not responding, the patient never responded. And you can imagine how much toxicity you can spare from, from drugs that do nothing, okay? So, of course, the next question is, can we identify if immunotherapy is working for appendiceal cancer or not? Well, I mean, this is not an appendiceal cancer, but it's another primary, it's another type of cancer, but I, I, I will tell you what we are doing. So the problem with immunotherapy is that it requires an intact immune system. So it requires your own immune system because it works through activating your own immune system to fight the cancer. And the tumor does not always have immune system in it. Sometimes it is infiltrated by, by immune system, by, by cells that we call them TILS, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, but not always, because not tumor is immunogenic. Not, tu not every tumor attracts the immune system, or it's like it's hidden from the immune system. So what we did, we said, well, I mean, every single patient has its own immune system. Every time we remove an organ, we remove the organ with the lymph nodes. 
at the lymph nodes represent 80% of your own immune system. So what we did is we took a, a, a tumor and we took the lymph node from the patient and we mixed them together and we grew them together. And this is what you see here. Here, down here, you have tumor only. And we hit it with Pembro and Nevo, and there is nothing that are immunotherapy drugs, and there is no killing at all. The moment we add the, the lymph node in the system, we can say if that drug is treating the patient, is killing the tumor or not. Because here you say the moment we add the, moment we add the lymph node, the upper side, the tumor is dying. And we are trying to replicate this type of experiments with the grant that we got from Nord uh, just this year. So this is another example that you, uh, you have a patient who almost tried every single immunotherapy drug. Nothing was working uh, for him. He was responding for, to uh, dabrafen and metrametinib. He got this drug and responded. And when he uh, developed, you know, because tumor, the tumor uh, evolves, uh, the tumor changes. Every time the cell multiplies, uh, very rarely uh, comes back to the previous stage. So when, when ericanis was developed and the tumor was different, there was no response anymore, and the organoid captured that result too. So conclusion, the organoid development is feasible, um, and it's feasible from a, a big variety, a range of primaries. Uh, we can grow uh, low-grade uh, disease, we can grow high-grade disease, we can grow rare primaries, and we can grow them at a very high rate. So it is promising because we believe it will change how we do research. I, probably years down the road. This concept will challenge the concept of prospective randomized trials. Who will be randomizing patients when you can decide what is working for every single individual patient separately? It can possibly change the study, study the tumor timeline on an individual basis. So if I have grown the tumor today and I have grown it and know how the tumor grows tomorrow and how the tumor looks in one month or two months or three months, if I use an artificial intelligence program, can I predict how the tumor will be looking when I, it comes back as a recurrence? Well, we don't know, but it's a possibility. We can replicate how the tumor interacts with the immune system of the own patient. This is unheard, we never had that before. And of course, we can have a new industry uh, focus on new, uh, on, new, on new targets because from a tumor like of that size, we can generate 150, 200 organoids. So if you have 200 organoids and you can test 200 different drugs, essentially you can test anything that is available currently in the market. So the other thing is possibly we can change how we treat. If you know what drug is doing what, and you have two drugs who are killing the same, why not choosing the drug that has the less toxicity? If you have two drugs who have a different cost, why not choosing the drug that is less expensive? So that has also implications for the healthier cost. I'm sure that we are gonna totally redirect the way we treat cancer. It is like a, um, not far away. We have created, and I probably I would like to um, tell you that as an announcement that uh, Wake Forest, a couple of days ago, uh, signed the agreement to develop uh, the, what we call the W-Force. The W-Force is the Wake Forest Organoid Research Center, so it's an institutional uh, commitment. And uh, you will be hearing from us uh, a lot in the, uh, in the next years. Uh, I would like to thank you uh, because I know so many of you and um, I've seen you um, receiving uh, the news of uh, this diagnosis, it's a horrible diagnosis, and I know that uh, you have managed to go that, through that with uh, a lot of grace. And uh, thank you very much for everything you have done for us. I, I know we're running way over and you guys are dying for a break, but if you can indulge me for literally one minute. Um, as Dr. V mentioned, he is the recipient of our most recent uh, grant program for this research, and we'd like to present him oh, with this ceremonial <laughs> Yes, I will. <laughs> you, to take with you. Thank you very much. You can hang it up in your office. Hey, let's have a picture.